Hello, my name is Tony. After Chateau's Land and The Mechanic, but just before Death Wish, came this modest and rather overlooked collaboration between director Michael Winner and actor Charles Bronson. A grim and violent tale of unorthodox cops and the mafia, based on the John Gardner pulp novel A Complete State of Death, with which it has very little in common, I might add. It was never fashionable to like Michael Winner or his films, even when they were popular with audiences and making money. So I've always been unfashionable then, because I loved his 60s and early to mid 70s output. He made the films he wanted to make the way he wanted to make them, and it just so happens they entertained the living crap out of me and made me glad I parted with money to see them. Well spent. And if that means being unfashionable, it's a small price to pay for the last in return. The success of Dirty Harry and the French Connection made renegade cop thrillers a going concern in the early 70s, and ushered in a new era of urban anti-heroes. What Siegel and Eastwood and Friedkin and Hackman begat, other directors and actors were quick to capitalise upon, Winner and Bronson included, hence the Stone Killer. Before we go any further, I'd like to take the opportunity to remind you of the importance of subscribing in order to maintain the continued growth, health and welfare of the channel. Even more important, if you're able to do so, is to hit the thanks button and make a very welcome contribution to keeping this channel up and running and promoting the production of new content. Many thanks, much appreciated. Now back to our main feature. Gardner's original novel was set in Britain and featured a Scotland Yard detective. The screenplay by Gerald Wilson, who had previously written Winner's superb duo of westerns, transplants the story to the US. It features New York police detective Lou Torrey, Charles Bronson, who relocates to Los Angeles. It's a sideways move, a case of his superiors wanting to kick him into the long grass after his methods draw adverse criticism in the Big Apple. In the opening minutes, Tori enters a slum building to arrest an armed teenage hood, fleeing the scene of a violent crime during which he killed a cop. The hood tries to abscond via a fire escape, and when cornered by Tori, tries to shoot him. Tori blasts the sucker out of this world, and it's this stark image that found its way onto much of the poster artwork and other promo material for the film. He's the third teenage hoodlum killed by the police in four weeks. Sounds like a good start to me, but some people are unimpressed. Pissed off by the less than favourable reaction he gets from the media and bleeding heart leftist liberal intelligentsia, Tori fucks off to LA, where a racist, aggressive and less culturally sensitive police force seem to be drawing far less flack. Yep, that's more like it. Two years later, with his fastidiously intolerant and radically blundering partner Matthews Ralph Waite, Tori apprehends Armitage Eddie Firestone. An ex-hitman for the mob, now an aging junkie, scraping a living as a drug dealer, Tori knows the crim is wanted for murder in NYC and lands the unenviable job of escorting him back there. Murder trumps drug pushing, you see. Before handing him over at the airport, Armitage mentions cutting a deal, because he's got some important info to trade about something or someone called Wexton, and some big something about to go down. Tori couldn't be more disinterested, until he hands Armitage over and the one-time heavy hitter gets blasted to death with a shotgun in a drive-by shooting. Suddenly, but belatedly interested in the man's desperate ramblings, although he can't pursue it any further with the guy himself as his guts have been splattered all over the scenery, Tori passes the information to his old boss and heads back to LA. For the sake of expediency, I'll cut through the convolution, shall I? Via further investigation, Tori gradually uncovers a plot by Mafia Don Vascari Martin Balsam, complete with a bristling moustache and dodgy Sicilian accent, to bump off most of the incumbent Italian and Jewish syndicate leaders. A replication of and long-awaited retaliation for the Night of Sicilian Vespers from 1931, in which a bunch of Mafia Dons were assassinated in one big go-round. Vascari will then swoop on in, do in the chaos and confusion to fill the power vacuum to run the show, the God Almighty Father. To achieve this, Vascari has engaged a group of Vietnam vets or stone killers to do the business. See, who says films aren't educational? I have learned that a stone killer is an unconnected outsider who performs hits for the mob. I didn't know this before, now I do, and it's been a great help, in ways I can't quite put into words, or thoughts, or any meaningful context at all really, but I know it now and can't unknow it. If it ever crops up in a pub quiz, I'm going to win that half pint a bitter hands down. 
The Stone Killer lacks the enduring scalpel sharp dash and sleek ageless atmospherics of Dirty Harry. The black humoured and clinically detailed death dealings of the mechanic and certainly the obsessive twitchy energy of the French connection. What it has got under the hood is an engine with sledgehammers in place of pistons. It's a battering ram of a movie with only a faint hint of sophistication. The emphasis is on things like shooting to kill and using vehicles as weapons to curtail the fleeing trajectory of suspects. Not to apprehend, you understand, but to flatten into the ground like badgers on a motorway, after causing as much collateral damage as possible in the process, of course. Paul Coslow, whose life expectancy in these sort of movies ranked between slim and fuck all, plays one of the ex-soldiers, who's also an accomplished jazz trombonist. None of which saves him from being the human badger Bronson plows over. In a more thoughtful film, the notion of Vietnam vets returning home and adapting their government-sponsored killing skills into profit-making may have resulted in some sort of exploration of the immoral side effects of war upon the warriors. Winner is not interested in any such meditation or contemplation. He's out to make a violent police procedural filmed like a series of direct punches in the face. None of this poncy, deep-dive psychosocial analysis here, thank you very much. Here we just beat, shoot and kill a lot of people and wreck some cars and architecture. It's a wrap. To that end, Gerald Wilson's steely and brutalist screenplay is a willing accomplice, cold and hard as a granite headstone in a slaughterhouse freezer. Charles Bronson, old stone face himself, is like the Terminator working a day job as an LA police detective. He shoots way better and far more accurately than any of his hopeless colleagues who seem to miss nearly everything they aim at. Not Charlie though, he hits the mark alright. Turns out eventually that Wexton is not a person but a place, a lodge in the Mojave Desert where the vets are living and training for their attacks, and just the sort of place for a vicious pitch battle between the Fuzz and the Mercs. Following this, where we're headed to is a final shootout in a New York skyscraper, culminating in a high body count and a lot of trashed exploding cars burning away in the parking garage. Worth the investment of your valuable time then? Well, it's never dull, I'll give it that. Bronson is mechanical and impenetrably stoic. He strides through the mayhem dispensing flippant deadpan lines of sardonic humour whilst occasionally fixating for some reason on a print hanging on the wall of his apartment. It's a copy of Goya's Saturn devouring his son. I'm not sure of the symbolism here or if Winner intended any, but I can try and analyse it. Uh, well, let's see. In the Greek myth of the Titan Cronus, who was known as Saturn in Roman mythology, there was a prophecy that he would be overthrown by one of his children. Rather than employ the obvious solution, practice safe sex and birth control so he wouldn't have any offspring to worry about, he ate his kids one by one upon their birth. What this means to Tori is... Well, I have no fucking clue. Maybe winners just having a laugh. Enough failed analysis, kids. Man's got to know his limitations, right, Harry? Harry? In the tangle of shootouts and chases, there are respites wherein the mystery of what's going down is unraveled to form a picture of the caper through investigative police work. It's handled with surprising intelligence and some thought. The final assault on the mob main men, led by head mercenary Lawrence Stuart Margolin, is nicely composed, the mercs gaining access to the venue by hooking up underneath an elevator. It's like a mini St. Valentine's Day massacre when they get there with their machine guns, ending with Lawrence putting an extra bullet into each still twitching corpse for good measure. A little coup de grace, just in case you were in any doubt as to what sort of film you're watching. It's a sadistic, violent actioner that takes few prisoners. There's not a great deal of humour, with most of what there is being generated by Ralph Waite. His bigoted character, so careless and hapless, he even sets fire to a waste paper basket at the precinct with a discarded match. His efforts to extinguish it only causing the small inferno to get bigger, until Tori wearily throws coffee over it. He gives rise to the best line in the movie also. Viewing a machine gun corpse, what hit him, he asks. A complete state of death, Bronson deadpans. A nice reference to Gardner's novel. What hit him? A complete state of death. There you go. So here's how the land lies. The Stone Killer is no Dirty Harry or French connection. In the canon of Winner Bronson collaborations, it's not as good as Chateau's Land, The Mechanic, or the original Death Wish. It is, however, streets ahead of any of the Death Wish sequels. You've got the addition of a really smart score by Roy Budd that the term retro could almost have been invented for. It's improved with age because it no longer sounds current if it ever did, and it partners Richard Moore's gritty exploitation-inspired cinematography almost perfectly. 
completely. Winner's no-nonsense style of direction keeps things moving at an unflagging pace, and the storyline, general ferocity and action more than competently hold the attention. If you are a fan of early 70s urban cop thrillers, then it's an essential view because you're a fan and it's one of those. If you're not a fan, it's a decent enough time waster and not a must watch. Word of warning to the hypersensitive, some of the language, turns of phrase, ethnic slurs, stereotyping, standard operational police brutality and disregard for human rights, life and limb might be a bit much for you. It's unapologetically of its time. There, that's my health and safety obligation to the resilience challenge dispensed with. If you're a wimpin' fairy brain flaker, best wait for the new version of Snow White and steer clear of this sort of thing. Rest of you with normal spinal composition and intellectual function, go for it if it's what takes your fancy. It'll burn down a Sunday afternoon quite nicely. Thanks for your time and attention, I appreciate it. Please consider hitting like, don't like, leaving a comment, subscribing, checking out my Patreon page, or tickling the very important thanks button below. You may grow to resent it, I fear, but what's life without a little resentment? Better. Yeah, alright. Other than that, I promise to pay the bearer by means of a return with something else soon. Bet you're breathless with anticipation. Later, pilgrims!